we want to take a look here at how the economy operates in the short run. We've seen some of those fluctuations with unemployment and inflation. And here we're going to develop a model to extend our understanding of, of how the economy moves in the short run. Why are there booms and busts, recessions and expansionary periods? So the model that we're going to use in this section is aggregate demand and aggregate supply. It's going to look just like uh, what we've done before, what you might have seen in micro, except there are going to be some key differences here that you're really going to need to pay attention to because it is a different model. It's based in macroeconomic theory. The curves are going to slope downward and upward for different reasons, so you need to be very comfortable with what's going on here. So here's a quick introduction of the model. We'll, we'll spend some time developing this in a second. So here is going to be our aggregate demand curve. It's sloping downward, just like you would expect with a demand curve. But notice this is aggregate demand. So this isn't just demand for a single good or service. It's all goods and services in the economy. Another key distinction here is what's happening on the axes here. This is now, instead of just the price of a single good, this is the price level. So this is a representation of the general level of all prices in the economy. We could do that with the GDP deflator or some other measure of prices, like maybe CPI or something. And then over here we have real GDP. So remember that distinction between nominal GDP and real GDP? Uh, nominal was in current prices and real was in prices of a base year. So you can think about real as being measured in actual goods and services accounting for any changes in prices, right? So real GDP is actual goods and services. So aggregate demand just shows the relationship between the price level and the quantity of real GDP demanded by households, firms, and the government. So we're thinking about an aggregate here. Similarly, with short run aggregate supply, it is upward sloping like we would have with a supply curve like you would think, but again, this is an aggregate. So this is the relationship in the short run between the price level on the y-axis and the quantity of real G GDP supplied by firms. So one of our key tasks to understand here is why the aggregate demand curve slopes downward and what causes it to shift. And then we'll look at the same thing for the aggregate supply curve. So we've looked at this equation before. We saw this in looking at just the components of GDP. Remember that uh, total output, this is like our real GDP, is comprised of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. If that is unfamiliar to you, you're going to want to go back and look at that because we're, we're really building on this in this section. So um, why does the aggregate demand curve slope downward? It's basically going to be, we're going to look at each of these kind of in turn here, how they affect aggregate demand. So that's what we're thinking about here, uh, building aggregate demand. So remember in our diagram, we have price level on the y-axis. As the price level falls, as there's deflation, that raises the real value of money. So each dollar becomes worth more as when there's deflation. That makes consumers wealthier, and that encourages them to spend more. So this is the wealth effect. So this would be, this is one of the reasons that the aggregate demand curve slopes downward. Or in reverse, if the price level rises, so when there's inflation, the real value that consumers have, the real value of the dollar falls, so that means they're going to consume less. So you can just think about it either way, if one sticks in your head easier, but it's, it's the same explanation, just in reverse. So here we're looking at the interest rate effect. This is aggregate demand and investment, how those two are related. Why, again, we're answering the question, why does the aggregate demand curve slope downward? So this mechanism is a little bit more involved, but stay with me here. So as the price level falls, consumers become wealthier, right? That's what we just saw with the wealth effect. So consumption is going to go up. That's the wealth effect. At the same time, because consumers are wealthier, they have more dollars than they need to buy all the goods they want. So basically, they have extra dollars on hand. They're going to lend some of those dollars out to earn interest. And when they do that, that pushes interest rates down. Remember, you can think of interest rates as the cost of borrowing or the return on saving. And for investment, that's what you should really think about is just borrowing. So when consumers loan out their money, that reduces the cost of borrowing. That's going to stimulate investment. So investment is going to go up. So a lower price level reduces the interest rate, encouraging greater spending on investment. And it's going to be the same thing in reverse. A higher price level, consumers need to borrow now. That pushes interest rates up. And that reduces investment because the interest rate is the cost of borrowing. A lower interest rate increases investment. A higher interest rate decreases investment. The next component we have to look at is net exports. We'll come back and take a look at G, government spending, when we look at fiscal policy. So net exports, remember, that is just exports minus imports. And we're thinking about aggregate demand on the y-axis. You have the price level. So how does a, what happens when the price level changes? 
When the price level rises in the U.S. relative to other countries, that makes U.S. exports relatively more expensive. So price level in the U.S. goes up, U.S. goods are now more expensive to buy abroad, and that also makes imports into the U.S. relatively cheaper. So this means fewer exports and more imports. That means net exports is going to fall because net exports is exports minus imports. So understand the mechanism for each of these, the wealth effect, interest rate effect, international trade effect. Notice that each of these moves in the same direction. So a price level, an increase in the price level decreases real GDP and or the opposite, a decrease in the price level raises real GDP. And so that's how we get that downward sloping aggregate demand curve. As we did before, we have a distinction between movement along the curve versus shifts of the curve. And the curve here, of course, is aggregate demand. So if there's a change in the price level that happens because of anything besides the shifters, so if anything, something that affects the price level that isn't a shifter, that's going to result in a movement along the curve. So that's just like a change in price before was a movement along the curve, right? A change in the price level not caused by a shifter of aggregate demand is a movement along the curve versus a change in some of those, one of those components of aggregate demand, the C, the I, the net exports, that would be a shift of our aggregate demand curve. So how would a shift in consumption, for example, why would that, why would that be a shift of the aggregate demand curve? If Americans suddenly became more concerned about saving for retirement and so, and reduce their current consumption, and that would apply at any price level, that would be a shift of our, of our aggregate demand curve because of that fall in consumption. So if they, Americans decide they need to save more and reduce current consumption, that's a fall in consumption. So aggregate demand moves back to the left. So wealth effect, interest rate effect, international trade effect, you need to be able to think through the reasoning of why the aggregate demand curve slopes downward. You also need to know the shifters. When you think about C, I, G, and an X, we'll take a look at G in a second. So what, what, what can cause the AD curve to shift? We, we talked about that a little bit. Here are some additional ways to think about the shifters here. Government policy is also going to be able to shift aggregate demand. There are two key uh, types of government policy, monetary po policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy is controlled by the Federal Reserve, the, the Fed, as it's often called. Um, and we often think about the Fed um, influencing interest rates. We'll take a closer look at monetary policy and fiscal policy later on, but just for right now, um, if the Fed influences interest rates and it causes interest rates to rise, remember interest rate is the cost of borrowing. So there's a negative relationship between the interest rate and investment. So if interest rates rise, investment falls. And if investment falls, that would be an AD curve shift to the left. If interest rate rates fall, investment increases, that's an AD curve shift to the right. So be able to go through these uh, the shifter here with interest rates, thinking about monetary policy. We also have fiscal policy. This is basically the spending and taxation of the government. So um, increasing or decreasing taxes, of course, that's going to affect disposable income. Disposable income is just how much income you have left over after paying taxes. Um, and so taxation is going to affect, of course, consumption. So if taxes go up, that's going to reduce consumption. AD is going to fall. If taxes fall, that's going to increase consumption and AD rises. So here's the, here's the shift from G. So the top curve here, we're really just thinking about spending. The government spends more. That increases aggregate demand because it's just C. Aggregate demand is C plus I plus G plus NX, right? So G goes up, so aggregate demand shifts. And here is the story that I was giving you about taxes. That's represented down here in this bottom one. So here are two more examples of shifters through consumption here and then investment here. So if households become more optimistic about the future, they think the economy is it's a, it's a bright and shiny place that might encourage them to increase spending now. So if consumption goes up because of that, that shifts the 80 curve to the right. If firms think that um, the investment outlook is bright for the future, that's gonna encourage investment, uh, like the future profitabil profit profitability is high that's going to increase investment. And so AD shifts to the right. If foreigners become worse off relative to us, if their incomes rise more slowly, that's going to affect our exports. They can't buy as much of as many U.S. goods. So our net exp our exports fall. And because we're wealthy relative to the other countries now, our imports are going to rise. So exports smaller, imports bigger, net exports falls. That's this shift right here, AD curve shifting back to the left. In the other case, if we become if they become wealthier relative to us, 
that's going to stimulate um, our exports and uh, lower our imports, and that would be an AV curve shift to the right. So be able to think through both of those scenarios. Similarly here with the exchange rate, a uh, higher exchange rate means the dollar is worth more. So that means we're able to buy more of foreign goods. They're able to buy less of ours. So if the exchange rate is higher, that is good for our imports. We're able to import things more cheaply, bad for our exporters. And so exchange rate higher, net exports fall. And that's what we have down here in the second graph. Same thing, be able to think through if the interest rate falls, what's that, what that's going to do. It's going to be the opposite case. Be able to follow all of that logic. For aggregate supply, we're going to have two curves to look at, a short run curve and a long run curve. Short run aggregate supply, SRAS, long run aggregate supply, LRAS, we'll see it abbreviated. You might label the curves that way. Um, and so first, let's look at long run aggregate supply. This is when we were thinking about what determined real GDP, remember, like the factors of production, those were things like the numbers of workers, level of technology, uh, inputs, and we're thinking here as the economy and the economy as a whole. Those kind of things are not affected by, by the price level. So uh, it's like, you know, capital, labor, all, all of those things, those are not affected by the price level. So our long run aggregate supply curve is not affected by the price level, it's just a vertical line. And this line is drawn at the level of potential or full employment GDP. So here we have long run average supply shifting over time because of increases in technology typically or the number of workers or capital stock. Any of those things cause this thing to shift to the right over time. In the short run though, price level does tend to have an effect on the quantity of goods and services supplied. So a couple of reasons for this. As the price of final goods and services rise, the prices of inputs tend to rise more slowly. And then we can also see that some firms are slow to adjust their prices uh, in response to a price level change. We are also going to take a look at expectations about the price level. This is going to be one of our shifters for our short run average supply curve. So three explanations you can think about. Why is this thing upward sloping? Well, sticky wages and prices may be coming through contracts. Firms are often hesitant to adjust wages. They don't want to, you know, they're there's a lot of pressure not to adjust wages down, even if prices have fallen in the economy, right? Nobody likes to get a, a pay cut. And then maybe menu costs may also make some prices sticky. So with sticky prices, we just mean slow to adjust for some reason. Maybe there's a labor contract, you've negotiated a salary of $50,000, and that's good for two years, no matter what the price level does. Um, if the price level rises, that's bad for you because the inflation eats into your $50,000, your real wage. But if price level falls, if they were deflation, that would be good for you because now your dollars purchase more, uh, but it's bad for the firm. Uh, it's, it's hard to predict sometimes what the price level is going to do over time. So expectations are going to play a big role. Do we expect inflation? How much do we expect? Firms are often slow to adjust wages. Like I said, for, nobody likes to give uh, pay cuts. That's, that's not good, a good thing. Uh, and then with menu cost, we're thinking about um, like just how much, it, like an actual menu, like McDonald's, maybe before it was digital, maybe this isn't as big of a deal, but actually go, having to go through and change the signs, change the catalogs, maybe it's too much work to change a the price just a little bit, um, given how much it's actually going to cost to physically change the sign or the printed catalog. So this slide is the same thing. We have this distinction between shifts of the curve and movements along it. A change in the price level that's not caused by a shifter is just a movement along the curve. But if we have a shifter, then that, of course, is going to shift our short run aggregate supply curve. So what actually shifts our short run aggregate supply curve? It's going to be anything that shifts the long run aggregate supply curve will also shift the short run aggregate supply curve. So remember, long run aggregate supply, that's like labor, capital, natural resources, any of those things. If, if say, there's a bunch of immigration, now there are new workers, that would shift long run aggregate supply. That also shifts short run aggregate supply. If technology approves, that's also going to shift short run aggregate supply. So you need to know these shifters, the difference between long run and short run aggregate supply curve. Take a careful look at expectations about future prices, how that's going to shift. Make sure you understand that logic there. You also need to take a look at supply shocks and expected versus unexpected decreases. I spent a lot of time developing the pieces of this model. You need to be able to put it together. So go through the textbook, look at all the examples. Uh, what causes the AD curve to shift? What happens in the short run? How do we get back to the long run? If there's a short run average supply curve shift, what, what kind of things would cause that? How, what's the short run equilibrium? How do we get back to the long run? So be able to go through lots of examples of that, uh, the various shifters, and then distinguishing, distinguishing between short run and long run equilibrium.